Hello everyone and welcome to Word of Mouth. For those of you who do not know, Word of Mouth is an adult story time presented by the Juliet Hampton Morgan Memorial Library. My name is Andrew and today I'm going to be reading two stories for you. The first is going to be The Dragon Danced at Midnight. The second is The 19th, both written by Ray Bradbury. If you enjoyed today's readings and would like to watch the next program, Word of Mouth is normally broadcast on the first and third Thursday of every month at 12.10 p.m. Central Time. You can watch it live through the Juliet Hampton Morgan Memorial Library's Facebook page, that's at MCCPL Morgan, or later on the uh, Montgomery City County Public Library's uh, YouTube page. I think that's all the announcements I have, so let's begin. The Dragon Danced at Midnight by Ray Bradbury. Remember the Aaron Stolitz jokes? How they called him the Vampire Bat because he was a fly-by-night producer? Remember his two studios? One a piano box, the other a cracker bin. Well, I worked in the cracker bin near the Santa Monica graveyard. Great! Dead, you just moved 90 feet south to a good address. Me? I plagiarized scripts, borrowed music, and edited film on Monster, the creature from across the hall, my mother liked it, it resembled her mother, the mobile mammoth, and all the other elephantine aphid and berserk bacillus films we shot between sunset and sunrise the next day. But all that changed. I lived through that great and awful night when Aaron Stolitz became world famous, rich, and nothing was the same after that. The phone rang early one hot September evening. Aaron was up front in his studio. That is, he was hiding in one 2 by 4 office, beating vinegar gnat sheriffs off the screen door. I was back splicing our latest epic film using stolen equipment when the phone buzzed. We jumped, afraid of bill collector wives shrieking long distance from forgotten years. Finally, I lifted the receiver. Hey, a voice cried. This is Joe Samasuku of the Samasuku Samurai Theater. Tonight at 8.30, we scheduled a genuine Japanese surprise studio feature preview, but the film has been waylaid at a film festival in Pacoima or San Luis Obispo. Who knows? Look, you got 90 minutes of film any way resembles a samurai widescreen or even a Chinese fairy tale. There's a fast 50 bucks in it. Give me the titles of your latest Somebody Stepped on Junior and Now He Looks Better Than Ever pictures. Island of Mad Apes, I suggested. Uneasy silence. Two tons of terror, I went on. The manager of the Samasuku Theater stirred to disconnect. The dragon uh, dances at midnight, I cried impulsively. Yeah. The voice smoked a cigarette. That dragon. Can you finish shooting, cutting, and scoring it in uh, one hour and thirty minutes? Monster apple pie. I hung up. The dragon dances at midnight, Aaron loomed behind me. We got no such film. Watch. I snapped some title letters under our camera. As the island of mad apes becomes the dragon dances, etc., etc. So I retitled the film, finished the music, old Leonard Bernstein outtakes run backward, and jockeyed 24 film reels into our Volkswagen. Usually films run nine reels, but while editing, you keep film on dozens of short spools so it's easier to handle. There wasn't time to rewind our epic. The Samasuku would have to make do with a couple dozen cans. We dented fenders roaring to the theater and ran the reels up to the projection booth. A man with a dire pirate's eye and breath like King Kong's exhaled cherry wine, grabbed our reels, slammed, and locked the metal door. Hey, cried Aaron. Quick, I said. After the show may be too late, let's go grab that 50 bucks and... I'm ruined! Ruined! said a voice as we went down to the stairs. Joe Samasuki, literally tearing his hair, stood staring at the mob as it jostled into the theater. Joe? we both said, alarmed. Look, he groaned. I sent telegrams warning them off, but there's been a foul up. And here comes Variety, Saturday Review, Sight and Sound, Manchester Guardian... Avant-garde cinema review. <laughs> Give me poisoned American food. Go on. Calm this, Joe, said Aaron. Our film ain't all that bad. It's not? I asked. Aaron, those super stomps, it's Harry Carey Productions after tonight. Calmness, said Aaron quietly, is a drink we can buy in the bar next door. Come on. 
film started with a great explosion of Dmitry Tiomkin themes upside down, backward, and super reversed. We ran for the bar. We were halfway through a double glass of serenity when the ocean crashed on the shore. That is to say, the audience in the theater gasped and sighed. Aaron and I raced out, opened the theater door to gaze in at whatever dragon happened to be dancing that midnight. I let out a small bleat, whirled, and leaped upstairs to beat on the projection room door with my tiny fists. Nincompoop! Laos, the reels are reversed! You got the number four reel in where it should be reel two. Aaron joined me, gasping to lean against the locked door. Listen. Behind the door, a tinkling sound like ice and something that wasn't water. He's drinking? He's drunk! Look, I said sweating. He's five minutes into the reel now. Maybe no one noticed. You in there. I kicked the door. You're warned. Line him up. Get him right. Aaron, I said, leading him shakily downstairs. Let's buy you some more calmness. We were finishing our second martini when another tidal wave hit the coastline. I ran into the theater, and I ran upstairs. I scrabbled at the projection room peak hole. Maniac destroyer, not real six, real three, real three. Open up so I can strangle you with my bare hands. He opened up another bottle behind the metal door. I heard him stumble over tin cans of film strewn on the concrete floor. Clawing my scalp like a scene in Medea, I wandered back down to find Aaron gazing deep into his glass. Do all movie projectionists drink? Do whales swim underwater? I replied, I shut. Does Leviathan plumb the ocean seas? Poet, said Aaron reverently. Speak on. My brother-in-law, I spoke, has been a projectionist at Trilux Studios for 15 years, which means 15 years in which he has not drawn a sober breath. Think of that. I am thinking. Fifteen years seeing day after day the rushes for Saddle of Sin, the rerun of Sierra Love Nest, the recut of Pitfall of Passion. The concussion alone would give a man bends. Worse in long run theaters. Imagine the 90th time you see Carol Baker in Harlow. Think, Aaron. Think. Madness, huh? Up the wall panics. Sleepless midnight's impotency. So, you start drinking. All across night America at this very hour. Conjure up the little settlements, the brave small forts, the big neon cities, and in every one this second Aaron, all the film projectionists, no exceptions, are drunker than hoot owl skunks. Drunk, drunk, drunk to a man. We brooded over this and sipped our drinks. My eyes watered, imagining 10,000 projectionists alone with their films and bottles across the prairie continent. The theater audience stirred. Go see what the madman's doing now, said Aaron. I'm afraid. The theater shook with a trembler of emotion. We went out and stared up at the projection room window above. He's got 24 realms of film in there, Aaron. How many combinations can you put together out of that? Real nine for real five? Real 11 for real 16, real 8 for real 24, real stop, Aaron groaned and shuddered. Aaron and I did not so much walk as run around the block. We made it around six times. Each time came back the shouts, squeals, and improbable roars of the crowd and as the theater got louder. My God, they're ripping up the seats. It wouldn't do that. They're killing their mothers. Movie critics, you ever see their mothers, Aaron? Epaulets down to here, battle ribbons across to there, work out at the gym five days a week, build and launch battleships in their off hours. Now, Aaron, break each other's wrists, sure, but kill their mothers? There was a gasp, a hiss, a long drawn sigh from the midnight dark within the California architecture. The big mission dome of the theater sifted dust. I went in to stare at the screen until the reels changed. I came out. Reel 19 in for reel 10, I said. At which moment, the theater manager staggered out, tears in his eyes, face all pale cheese, reeling from wall to wall with despair and shock. What have you done to me? What are you doing? He shrieked. Bums, bastards, ingrates, 
The Jo Samasuku Samurai Theater is ruined forever. He lunged at us, and I held him off. Joe, Joe, I pleaded. Don't talk like that. The music swelled. It was as if film and audience were inflating themselves towards a vast, ripped-forth explosion, which might tear mind from matter as flesh from bone. Joe Samasuku fell back, pressed a key in my hand, and said, Call the cops. Telephone the janitor service to clean up after the riot. Lock the doors if the doors are left. And don't call me. I'll call you. Then he fled. We would have dogged him out of his old California patio and down the mean streets had not at that instant a huge stolen chunk of Berlio and a cymbal smash straight out of Beethoven ended the film. There was a stunned silence. Aaron and I turned to stare madly at the shut, tight theater doors. They banged wide open. The mob, in full cry, burst into view. It was a beast of many eyes, many arms, many legs, many shoes, and one immense and ever-changing body. I'm too young to die, Aaron remarked. You should have thought of that before you mess with things better left to God, said I. The mob, their great beast, stopped short, quivering. We eyed it. It eyed us. There they are, someone shouted at last. The producer, the director. So long, Aaron, I said. It's been great, said Aaron. And the beast, rushing forward with an inarticulate cry, threw itself upon us, hoisted us onto its shoulders, and carried us, yelling happily, singing, slapping us on the back, three times around the patio, out into the street, and then back onto the patio again. Aaron? I stared down aghast into a swarming sea of beautific smiles. Here loped the reviewer of the Manchester Guardian. There bounded the mean and dyspeptic critic from the Greenwich Village of Auntie. Beyond gambled ecstasies of second-string film reviewers from Saturday Review, The Nation, and The New Republic. And far out on the shore of this tumultuous sea, in all directions, there was a frolic and jump, a laughing and waving of columnists from Partisan Review, Sight and Sound, Cinema, multitudinous beyond belief. Incredible, they cried. Marvelous, superior to Hiroshima Monomore. Ten times better than last year at Marion Bad. One hundred times greater than greed. Classic. Genius. Makes giant look like munchkin. My god, the new American wave is in. How do you do it? Do what? I yelled, looking over at Aaron, being carried for the fourth time around the lobby. Shut up and ride high in the saddle. Aaron can sailed over the ocean of humanity on a sea of smile. I blinked up, wild, strange tears in my eyes. And there, in the projection room window above, a shadow loomed with wide sprung eyes. The projectionist, bottle in numbed hand, gasped down upon our revelry, ran his free fingers over his face in self discovery, stared at the bottle, and fell away in a shadow before I could shout. When at last the hopping, dancing dwarves and gazelles were exhausted and laughing out their final compliments, Aaron and I were set back down on our feet with. The most tremendous avant-garde film in history. We had high hopes, said I. The most daring use of camera, editing the jump cut and the multiple reverse storyline I can remember, everyone said at once. Plan and pays off, said Aaron modestly. You're competing in the Edinburgh Film Festival, of course. No, said Aaron, bewildered. We planned on it after we show at the Cannes Film Festival competition, I cut in. A battalion of flash cameras went off, and like a tornado that dropped Dorothy and Oz, the crowd whirled on itself and went away, leaving behind a litter of cocktail party promises, interviews set, and articles that must be written tomorrow, next week, next month. Remember, remember. The patio stood silent. Water dripped from the half-dry mouth of a satyr cut in an old fountain against the theater wall. Aaron, after a long moment of staring at nothing, walked over and bathed his face with water. The projectionist, he cried suddenly, remembering. We prounded upstairs and paused. This time we scratched at the door like two small hungry white mice. After a long silence, a faint voice mourned. Go away. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to do it. Didn't mean it? Hell, open up. All is forgiven, said Aaron. You're nuts, the voice replied faintly. Go away. 
Not without you, honey. We love you, don't we, Sam? I nodded. We love you. You're out of your mother minds. Feet scraped tin lids and rattling film. The door sprang open. The projectionist, a man in his mid-forties, eyes bloodshot, face a furious tint of boiled crab red, stood swaying before us, palms out and open to receive the driven nails. Beat me, he whispered. Kill me. Kill you? You're the greatest thing that ever happened to dog meat in the can. Aaron darted in and planted a kiss on the man's cheek. He fell back, beating the air as if attacked by wasps, spluttering. I'll fix it all back, just just the way it was, he reclined. He cried, bending to scrabble the strewn film snakes on the floor. I'll find the right pieces and... Don't, said Aaron. The man froze. Don't change a thing, Aaron went on, more calmly. Sam, take this down. You got a pencil? Now, what's your name? Willis Hornbeck. Willis, Willie. Give me the order. Which reels first, second, third, which reversed upside down, backwards, the whole deal. You mean, the man blinked, stupid with relief. I mean, we gotta have your blueprint, the way you ran the greatest avant-garde film tonight in history. Oh, for God's sake. Willis let out a hoarse, choking laugh, crouched among the tumbled reels and the insanely littered floor where his art lay waiting. Willis, honey, said Aaron, you know what your title is going to be as of this hour of this fantastic night of creation? Mud, inquired Hornbeck, when I shut. Associate producer of Hasserite Productions, editor, cutter, director even, maybe, a ten-year contract, escalations, privileges, stock buy-ins, percentages, Okay, now. Ready, Sam, with the pencil? Willis, what did you do? I, said Willis Hornbeck, I don't remember. Aaron laughed lightly. Sure you remember. I was, I was drunk, then I got scared sober. I, I'm sober now, I, I don't remember. Aaron and I gave each other a look of pure animal panic. Then I saw something on the floor and picked it up. Hold on. Wait, I said. We all looked at the half-empty sherry bottle. Willis, said Aaron. Yes, sir. Willis, old friend. Yes, sir. Willis, said Aaron. I will now start this projection machine. Yes. And you, Willis, will finish drinking whatever's in that bottle. Yes, sir. And you, Sam? Sir, said I, saluting. You, Sam, said Aaron, flicking the machine so a bright beam of light struck out into the quiet night theater and touched an emptiness that lay waiting for genius to paint incredible pictures on the white screen. Sam, please shut and lock the heavy tin door. I shut and locked the heavy tin door. Well, the dragon danced at midnight film festivals all around the world. We tamed the lion at Venice at the Venice Film Festival, we took first honors at the New York Film Festival and the Brasilia Special Prize at the World Film Competition. And not just one film, no, with six. After The Dragon danced, there was a big international smash success of our The Dreadful Ones. Then there was Mr. Massacre and Onslaught, followed by The Name is Horror and Waddle. With these, the names of Aaron Stolitz and Willis Hornbeck were honey on the lips of reviewers under every flag. How did we make five more smash hits in a row? The same way we made the first one. As we finished each film, we grabbed Willis, rented the Samasuku Theater at 12 midnight, poured a bottle of the finest sherry down Willis's throat, handed him the film, started the projector, and locked the doors. By dawn, our epic was slashed to ribbons, tossed like monster salad, gathered, re-spliced, glued fast with the epoxy of Willis Hornbeck's subliminal genius, and ready for release to the waiting avant-garde theaters in Calcutta and Far Rockaway. To the end of my insignificant life, I shall never forget those nights with Willis shambling among his whirring, shadow-flickering machines, 
floundering about from midnight until dawn, filled the patio of the Samasuku Theater with a gold the pure color of money. So it went, film after film, beast after beast, while the pesos and rubles poured in. And one night, Aaron and Willis grabbed their Academy Oscar for experimental film. And we all drove XKE Jags and lived happily ever after, yes? No. It was three glorious, fine, loving years high on the avant-garde hog. But one afternoon, when Aaron was chortling over his bank account, in walked Willis Hornbeck to stand facing the big picture window overlooking Hasarai Productions. Huge back lot. Willis shut his eyes and lamented in a quiet voice, beating his breast gently and tearing ever so tenderly at his own lapels. I am an alcoholic. I drink. I am a terrible lush. I booze, just, just name it. Rubbing alcohol? Sure. Mentholated spirits? Why not? Turpentine? Spar varnish? Hand it over. Nail polish removal? Pure gargle. Rum dummy? Mad fool? Long time no see the light of day? Willis Hornback, but that's all over. The pledge? Give me the pledge. Aaron and I ran over and circled Willis, trying to get him to open his eyes. Willis, what's wrong? Nothing's wrong. All's right. He opened his eyes. Tears dripped down his cheeks. He took our hands. I hate to do this to you, nice guys, but... But... But last night... Last night? Bleated Aaron. I... I joined Alcoholics Anonymous. You what? Screamed Aaron. Alcoholics Anonymous. I joined... You can't do that to me, Aaron jumped up and down. Don't you know you're the heart, soul, lungs, and lights of House of Rye Productions? Don't think I haven't put it that way to myself, said Willis simply. Aren't you happy being a genius, Willie? shrieked Aaron. Faded wherever you go, internationally famed. That ain't enough? You gotta be sober, too? We're all so famous now, said Willis, and loved and accepted. It, it has filled me up. I'm so full of fame, there's no room for drink. Make room, said Aaron. Make room! Ironic, huh? said Willis. Once I drank because I felt I was nobody. Now, if I quit, the whole studio falls down. I'm sorry. You can't break your contract, I said. Willis looked as if I had stabbed him. I wouldn't dream of breaking my word, but where does it say in plain English in the contract that I gotta be drunk to work for you? My tiny shoulders sagged. Aaron's tiny shoulders sagged. Willis finished gently. I'll go on working for you, always, but you know and I know. Sober it won't be the same. Willis, Aaron sunk into a chair, and after a long and private agony went on. Just, just one night a year. The pledge, Mr. Stolitz. Not a drop, not once a year, even for dear and beloved friends. Holy Moses, said Aaron. Yeah, I said. We're halfway across the Red Sea, and here come the waves. When we glanced up again, Willis Hornbeck was gone. It was indeed the twilight of the gods. We had been turned back into mice. We sat a while, squeaking gently. Then Aaron got up and circled the liquor cabinet. He put out his hand to touch it. Aaron, I said, you're not going to... What? said Aaron. Cut and edit our next avant-garde epic, Sweet Beds of Revenge? He seized and opened a bottle. He swigged. All by myself? Yeah. No. The dead rocket fell out of the sky. The gods knew not only twilight, but also that awful, sleepless three o'clock in the morn when death improves on countenance. Aaron tried drinking. I tried drinking. Aaron's brother-in-law tried drinking. But 
Look, none of us had the euphoric muse which once walked with Willis Hornbeck. In none of us did the small worm of intuition stir when alcohol hit our blood. Bums sober, we were bums drunk. But Willis Hornbeck drunk was almost everything the critics claimed. A wild man who blind wrestled creativity in a snake pit. Who fought an inspired alligator in a crystal tank for all to see. And sublimely won. Oh sure, Aaron and I bulled our way through a few more film festivals. We sunk all our profits into three more epics. But you smelled the change when the titles hit the screen. Hasarai Films folded. We sold our package to Educational TV. Willis Hornbeck, he lives in Monterey Park Truck House, goes to Sunday school with his kids, and only occasionally is reminded of the maggot of genius buried in him when a critic from Glasgow or Paris strays by to chat for an hour, finds Willis a kindly but sober bore, and departs in haste. Aaron and me, we got this little shoebox studio 30 feet closer to the graveyard wall. We make little pictures and profits to match, and still edit them in 24 reels and hit previews around Greater California and Mexico, smash and grab. There are 300 theaters within striking distance. That's 300 projectionists. So far, we've previewed our monsters in 120 of them. And still, on warm nights like tonight, we sweat and wait and pray for things like this to happen. The phone rings. Aaron answers and yells, Quick! The Arcadia Barcelona Theater needs a preview. Jump! And down the stairs and press past the graveyard we trot, our little arms full of film, always laughing, always running towards that future where somewhere another projectionist waits behind some locked projection room door, bottle in hand, a look of unraveled genius in his red eye, a great blind worm in his soul waiting to be kissed awake. Wait, I cry as our car rockets down the freeway. I left Real 7 behind! It'll never be missed! Aaron bangs the throttle. Over the roar, he shouts, Willis Hornbeck Jr. <laughs> Willis Hornbeck Jr. the second. Wherever you are, watch out! Sing it, Sam, to the tune of Someday I'll Find You. The 19th by Ray Bradbury. It was getting on toward dusk as I drove down Motor Avenue one late afternoon and saw the old man walking on the far side of the road, picking up lost golf balls. I braked the car so fast I almost fell against the windshield. I let the car stand in the middle of the street for another ten seconds. There were no cars following. And then I slowly backed up, still no cars, until I could peer over into the gully by the golf course wire screen and see the old man bend to pick up another ball and put it in a small bucket he was carrying. No, I thought. Yes, I thought. No. But I swerved over and parked the car and sat a moment, trying to decide what to do, a mystery of tears in my eyes for no reason I could figure. And at last, I got out, let traffic pass, and crossed the street heading south in the gully as the old man headed north. We finally came face to face about 50 paces from where I had entered the gully. Hi, he said quietly, nodding. Hi, I said. Nice night, he said, glancing around at the turf and then down at his half-filled bucket of golf balls. Having luck, I said. You can see. He hefted the bucket. Darn good, I said. Can I help? What? He said, puzzled. Look for more? No. I wouldn't mind, I said. It'll be dark in another five minutes. We'd better find the darn things before it's too late. That's true, he said, regarding me curiously. Why would you want to do that? My dad used to come along here years ago. I said. He always found something. His income was small, and sometimes he would spend the money that he got selling the balls. I'll be, said the old man. I'm out here twice a week. Last week I sold enough balls and took my wife out to dinner. I know, I said. What? 
I mean, I said, let's keep going. There's one down there and another over by the fence. I'll get the one down there. I walked down and found the ball and brought it back and stood holding it while the old man examined my face. How come you're crying? He asked. Am I? I said. Look at that. Must be the wildflowers. I'm, I'm allergic. Do I know you? He said abruptly. Maybe. I told him my name. I'll be darned. He laughed quietly. That's my name, too. Well, my last name. I don't suppose we're related. I don't suppose, I said. Because I'd, I'd remember if we were related, that is, or, or if we'd met before. Lord, I thought. So this is how it is. Alzheimer's is one thing. Going away forever is another. With both, you forget. Once you've passed over, I guess you don't need your memory. The old man was watching me think. It made him uncomfortable. He took the golf ball from me and put it in his bucket. Thanks, he said. There's another one, I said, and ran down the slope and brought it back, wiping my eyes. Do you still come here often? I said. Still? Why not? He said. Oh. I was just wondering, I said, if I ever wanted to come hunting again. For the hell of it, you know. If it were... Uh, if you were here, it would be a lot easier. It sure as hell would, he agreed. He studied my face again. Funny thing, I had a son once. Nice boy, but he went away. Never could figure out where he went. I know, I thought. But he didn't go away. You did, that's how it must be. When you're saying goodbye, people seem to go away. When all the while, it's you who are backing off, fading out, going, and gone. Now the sun was completely gone, and we walked in half-darkness lit only by a single street lamp across the way. I saw a last golf ball a few feet to the old man's left and nodded. He stepped over and picked it up. Well, I, I guess that's it, he said. He looked me in the face. Where to? He said. I turned my thoughts and glancing ahead. Isn't there always a 19th hole on every course? The old man gazed ahead through the dark. Yeah, I mean, sure, there should be one up there. Can I buy you a drink? I said. Nice of you, he said, eyes clouded with uncertainty. But I, I don't think just one, I urged. It's, it's late, he said. I got to go. Where? I said. That was the wrong question. His eyes clouded even more. He had to search around for a lame answer. Well, he said, you see, he added, I, I think, no, don't say, I, I hate being nosy. It, it's all right. Well, I've got to be going. He reached out to take my hand and suddenly seized it and held it tight, staring into my eyes. We, we know each other, he cried, don't we? Yes, I said. But, but from where? How far back? He said. A long way, I said. He wouldn't let go of my hand. He clenched it tight as if he might fall. What did you say your name was? I said my name. Funny, he said, and then lowered his voice. That's my name too, I think. Us meeting here like this and, and with the same name. That's the way it goes, I said. I tried to pry my hand free, but it wouldn't come. When I finally burst free, I immediately shoved it back and took his hand in a similar vice. Next time, I said, the 19th hole. The 19th, he said. You going to come back through here again? Now that I know where you are, 
On certain nights, it's it's a good walking and finding place. Not many saps like me. He looked around at the empty grass patch behind him. It's, it's getting lonely. I'll try to come more often, I said. You were just saying that. No, honest to God. Honest to God is, is a good promise. The best. Well, now it was his turn to pry his hand free and massage it to get the circulation back. Here goes nothing. And he ambled off. About ten feet along the far path, he saw a final ball and picked it up. He nodded and gave it a toss. I caught it easily and held it like a gift in my hand. The nineteenth, he called quietly. Absolutely, I called back. And then he was gone in the darkness. I stood there with tears running down my cheeks and felt the golf ball as I put it in my breast pocket. I wonder, I thought, if it'll be there in the morning. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. That's our two stories. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed them uh, as much as I enjoyed picking them out for you. Uh, next time is going to be two weeks from today. Um, that is going to be on August 6th, once again at uh, 1210 p.m. Central Time. Uh, next time I do not have them written down. Uh, I do have several stories um, picked out for you, though. Uh, they are, uh, if I remember correctly, The Magic Shop by H.G. Wells, as well as one called The Appointment, uh, whose author I do not remember off the top of my head. Uh, hopefully you will enjoy them uh, next uh, two weeks from today, and, and uh, we'll tune in for that. Thank you so much.